So thank you. Thank you, Google, for hosting us and Laura for being here and our wonderful host. Um, welcome to Startup Grind and uh, so nice to see you guys here. Startup Grind is active now in about 600 cities around the world, um, hosting fireside chats, uh, sharing the information from people who have been there, done that, and trying to help you learn a little bit uh, along your way and make your journey a little bit uh, less lonely and more informative. So if you are looking to connect with someone for your startup or for business or for anything around the world, um, a lot of you have met Aliki in the back, my co-director. Um, so reach out to Aliki or myself and happy to connect you um, around the world or here locally as well. So without Further ado, I wanted to welcome Nilsson and uh, thank you so much for coming here tonight, for being with us and taking some time uh, to share your story with us. Thank you likewise for inviting me. I think I was, uh, it's a bit of a special moment because I was sitting in one of those seats, I don't know, like three years ago, so uh, <laughs> this is really nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as someone was asking me earlier about um, success stories and I th it's always interesting to see how people how different companies uh, progress and grow, and the the yeah the way things evolve. Um, so it's exciting to see you move up a few seats. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, we 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 like to start off uh, um, going back in time a little bit um, to ask you know where you come from, as in where were you born? I'm actually born and raised here in Zurich, um, in uh, in Hottingen, and my girlfriend is now called Hottinger, so. That was meant to be. Um, no, I grew up here. Um, I'm a Zurich boy uh, in that sense. Then left the city um, first for sport and later for studies. Um, stayed in Maastricht, um, a liberal arts and science program, which I can duly recommend because it's uh, a very, very nice program and that actually brought me into entrepreneurship in the first place, um, which was an open curriculum. So the, the liberal arts and science kind of program, which is inspired by the US education system, is, is you have 500 courses you can pick from. Um, and that was for, for me the starting point where I um, first broadened my mind and then found my way into entrepreneurship. As, as a child when you were younger in school, uh, did you already have any entrepreneurial tendencies? Um, I got myself very fast into sports and then my life was pretty much absorbed with that. What kind of sport? Um, so I was doing figure skating for 14 years. Figure skating. And um, so that was my, my life was school and the ice rink at Dolder and then back home and doing homework and then go back to school. So um, yeah, <laughs> no, no additional time. <laughs> and so uh, as, as a sport, as a competition or how did, how did so yeah, you were competing? I was, yeah, I was a national champion at one point. And I think now looking backwards, um, I think being an athlete taught me a lot about um, myself and how to be uh, resilient and how to stand up, especially in skating where you fall a lot on your, on your butt cheeks and then uh, you, you literally have to stand up again, right? And I think as an entrepreneur, that's something which is coming in very handy now. Very true, very true. Um, and, and from your family, your parents, was there any yeah. um, business well, inclination? Yes, yes. I think. Up to my grandparents, everyone had either an SME or a larger company. So I really come, I think my, parent, my, my dad never worked for, for some, was never employed. He, he is a dentist, so he's not like, a, um, in German you say, um, selbstständig. I, I think most of, of those type of professions don't see themselves as entrepreneurs, but I think they actually really are very important entrepreneurs, but they don't see themselves as that. So. Um, but it's still, it's still that notion of being, being, being self-employed and being your own boss and being responsible for running the business in the first place. Um, and my grandpa as well. Um, and the same for my, for my mother's side. Mm -hmm. So I have a bit of, uh, okay. of, of genetic um, or, I don't know, historic or whatever um, baggage <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. But did you think that uh, when you were competing as a figure skater, did you think you'd do that for the rest of your life? Or how did you feel about the sport? And no, I, th I think like for, for skating for me was never an option to, I always wanted to have something more than sports. Um, and that's not, not meant in a negative way. I think it was just for me, the, the mental exercise was something that was really fascinating me also in school. So this was one of the reasons why I always kept 
the educational part next to my sports really, um, really, really strict and also didn't cut down on that path because I really wanted to have um, the chance to, to educate myself and, and, and go into a different direction after, mm -hmm. after doing sports. So that's why you went to, to Holland to support? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. and, and where did the idea of uh, a big, big, big camera come from? Um, so, what, so tell us a little bit about, yeah, exactly. uh, about um, so, so it's funny that you mentioned because I think you, you still know us from the time where um, we were all about a camera and I think now we, we moved on a, a very, um, very good stretch from that. So today um, we're basically stating that we want to connect the digital and the, world and the, and the physical world. And we're stating that um, the whole reason why we want to do that is that the next big industrial or the fourth industrial revolution is all about making the real physical world we live in machine readable or accessible for software in the first place. Um, and this is one, for, for us, a big hypothesis that the ne next big tech revolution is going to be around that. And especially the applications which come out of that, um, in our opinion, will really change the lives we, we, we live today. And good examples for that are autonomous vehicles, augmented reality, Internet of Things, and all of those are the, the early kind of signs that the, what happens the moment you make the world we live in um, readable for software. Um, and this is what we've, we've come to. Um, the big bet we take uh, within that, or the, the way we solve that is by providing um, a one-on-one -on -one replication of the world we live in. So our big goal as a company is to provide the infrastructure that a one-on-one -on -one representation of the world we live in is available as a digital format. And that starts from a 3D model, but goes down to pedestrian data, to traffic data, to energy consumption of a house to any type of data that you can collect about the, the world we live in. Um, and from our side, we provide the 3D aspect of it, um, plus the infrastructure that all of this data can be gathered in one point, because that's the moment where you really can start interlinking the different data points and really make sense of, of the world you live in. Um, and then on the other hand of, of all of that, be able for people to build applications on top of it. So use that that raw format or that, that digital representation of the world and build what we call spatial applications on top of it. And the way we got to that point is basically that we, we had early insights on how high resolution imagery can actually solve the problem of um, producing that 3D world at scale. And, and that's the, the very, very early starting point for us as a company. But which, which, was the, which was the camera. Exactly. So tell and us a little bit about the camera. I want. <laughs> uh, this is how, in the Valley, they always call it, it's the, the secret sauce. Okay. Um, so this is something um, we, we really keep for ourselves. Um, and I think by now it's also much more than that, right? I mean, it, it really became a whole process and I, actually we realized that um, the high resolution imagery is just a starting point. It's like the, the seed of an entire plan and in the end. Okay. Um, there's a lot more that you have to do in order to get to, to where we are today. Um, in the beginning, though, it was about uh, extremely high-resolution imagery. So how, wh what sparked that idea? Um, I think that particular idea really came from me doing a lot of photography at a time um, and just not be satisfied with the image quality you would get at the time. Um, and then making that connection to if you have that much resolution, so if you have infinite detail in, in, a, in a 2D image, what would that do in order to make um, 3D modeling or, or photogrammetry into a different space? And, and then from there, all those possibilities started to pop up. And, and that was the, the original source of, of just wanting to have more detail in images okay. and just wanting to have a better camera. I think this is what, what sparked it. So it's kind of the typical uh, entrepreneurial um, wanting to satisfy your own need or wanting to yeah. Fix your own problem. So many of, of, uh, of, of products and, and things that we have nowadays comes from people wanting to solve a personal problem. Yeah. And then it grows from there and you realize there's so much more to it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is, I, and I think this is something you see a lot of times because it's, it's a good starting point because you basically understand that problem well because you're your own user, right? So at that very moment, you, you have that problem yourself, so you understand that problem, so you understand what the solution for that problem is. And I think this is what, as a company, um, is a difficult journey that you have, that you have to basically s keep on staying your own customer. And even if you evolve and if you, in you start introducing new products or new features or anything else in that regard, I think that that element of basically knowing what the problem is in the first place 
and, and really understanding that problem and really being in the shoe of the people or companies who have that problem, I think is an, an extremely important skill um, as a company to, to really um, harness and really foster over the times. A question that often comes to my mind is that often the way entrepreneurs solve their own personal problem works for them personally, but doesn't mean that it works for everyone out there. Of course and, not. <laughs> and then, so how do you, um, how have you gone about growing from just solving your personal problem to something that you can sell? Yeah, I, I think um, the really important step is for anyone, you have to talk to the other people or companies and first of all, figure out do they have the same problem and then after that is confirmed, you have to figure out is the problem fixed with the solution that you provide. And I think this is something which um, is scary at times. And I think this is the, the natural reflex is, well, I'm, I'm gonna build my product. And I think especially here in Europe, we, we have that tendency, no, no, I'm not gonna show it to anyone. I just further improve my product. And I'm gonna make it a little bit better and I'm gonna add that feature because then it's gonna be an all different product and it's gonna be completely different. And, and the people will understand why they need it. And, and then you wait and wait and wait and wait. And then you finally ship it to someone and, and show it to someone and then the feedback as well. Okay, so now uh, don't care. And I think this is something which um, the lead methodology I think really introduced and which is, is a very, very important um, mindset. I think it's, it's all about a mindset that you start realizing you don't have to start with your perfect product, right? And you really can start with, with the crappy product and we actually had on, on a drive back on, on Thursday from Zug, we, we had that, that conversation with one of our guys. I said like, you know, the 70s companies, like the big tech companies in the 70s, they started out with shitty products. And, and they were, were okay with launching bad products into the market. And now we're, we're at a point where, where the expectation towards products is so high that we really start to wait and wait and wait and really have to have a polished version and, or at least a feeling that we need to have that. And I think that is, is, a, is a dangerous mindset for an entrepreneur because you have to kind of get that out early on and, and get that feedback early, um, even if it's not as good as you imagine it. And it will never be because any entrepreneur, I think, has a million ideas on how the product could be different. But um, that's something, get that old, old 70s um, spirit back into you. There's that famous saying that if you're happy with your product, then you've launched too late. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's so, it's so important to get feedback early on yeah. and be able to iterate until you can to really hit the mark with what, yeah. you're, what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so um, as, as many people here are in various stages of, of their own uh, entrepreneurial journey, money is always a make or break um, challenge that people face. So what it, how did it work for you when it came to funding? How did, like when you were telling your first uh, investors about the idea, was it easy to sell the idea or is that something that evolved over time from you being able to express it? And yeah, yeah, I, I think um, I'm bar is smiling <laughs> because um, when, when you go back to the very, very early um, documentation we did, even in 2015, we already included basically everything that we are today with autonomous vehicles and, and 3D models of cities and, and everything. Of course, not in that granularity and in that um, execution, but the, the general ideas were already there back then. But we had to talk much more about the camera because the people were like, well, for what do I need 3D models? And autonomous vehicles are gonna be there in 50 years. And what is augmented reality in the first place? And who does really care? Yeah, maybe the gamers, but computer games are not really a big thing anyways, and this and that. So it was a very, very different environment than today. And, and I think then uh, for us, a big shift was when Pokemon Go hit and, and when people started to realize, oh shit, this is gonna be big. And, and for me, Pokemon Go is, is, an, is an all, in all awe to what it did, but it's not augmented reality for me. It's a location-based game. And, and it somehow superimposed a little bit of a video feed over your camera and, and that's it. It's not even AR and it was already so powerful. And I think this was the moment for us as a company where people started to understand very, very fast, oh, this is gonna be big. And I think, um, so that changed the story for us a lot. And that moment you can start focus on, on different topics. And I think this is something um, which 
from then on continued. And I think we had that other notion of, um, so th in the industry you call uh, the digital twin, this comes from the IoT space, basically a uh, digital representation of a physical process or product. Um, and that's something a year ago we had to explain to every person that we met or, or had a phone call with. And, and today that's something which is just, it's just there as a concept, and that helps immensely um, if you do something like what we're doing in order to convey the message. When it comes to funding, I think, um, to actually go back to your question um, in the first place, uh, when, it, when, you, when you go back to funding, I think you have to always be aware in what stage are you as a company, and who are the right investors for that stage of the company. And I think that uh, immensely uh, changes the story you have to tell. And, and I think if you're super early stage and if you have just an idea and that idea might be brilliant, but you are still far away from, from traction, all of that, you have to talk to different people and you have to talk a little bit different and have a bit of a different story than if you have uh, millions of users and a uh, complete growth curve and you can basically just throw the numbers into the VC world and they will pick it up and say like, uh, boom, we have to do it, and they, uh, at that point, the, the, the product might become even secondary because you can simply raise money with traction purely. And, and I think this is what you have to be aware of, and you have to just adjust your story based on, on what stage you are in. Was it easy for you to get funding? I think it's always a struggle. I think it's never, um, I think anyone who says it's easy, I want to meet that person, <laughs> first of all. Um, and second of all, um, we're in an environment, I think, in Switzerland where startups are not yet a big thing. I think we, we, we still have to have those massive successes um, that people start thinking about it in terms of this is something to invest in, right? So this is, I think here we don't have the unicorns, we don't have the, the private and angel investors which made millions, we don't have um, those success stories just yet were early employees exit companies and they have 30, 40, 50 million on the bank account um, with the stocks they had in, in the company. Um, and there's other regions in the world where this happens on a regular basis um, or on a more regular basis. And I think the moment we have that, the whole ecosystem will change here um, dramatically. Um, and I think having that, it's the first thing you have to explain to someone with money that a startup is a thing to invest in in the first place. Um, so that's already hard, and then you have to convince the person about you, and then you have to convince the person that it's not like the other startup that he invested or she invested in 10 years ago and never saw the money again. Um, so, so all of that, I think, is something which is, which is simply hard to do, and um, especially in a, in a more risk-averse culture than we have here. Yeah, right. But it's changing now, so that's good. Can you say where you're at right now in funding? Yeah, so we... we Accumulated, so we did um, only, um, or we only raised money with private people okay. um, for a very particular reason. Um, I'm not gonna disclose how much we raised, um, but that was a very deliberate choice um, because we, we wanted to have um, that personal relationship with those, um, those investors and we wanted to have their personal network as well. And I think that's something that we related to and we were also able to say, this is a long-term project. This is not something where within half a year we can have massive traction and we can uh, attract that many users and, and write the Instagram or WhatsApp story of this world. I think this was very, very clear from the very beginning that this is a long play, that we need to develop heavy technology in order to succeed and, and um, we build a product for the future and not something which is in stores now. And I think that was the, the reason why we chose um, private individuals and and entrepreneurs and angels and, and high net worth individuals in the first place. Okay. Um, going back a little bit to the VR topic, how do you personally use VR in your in your day to day? VR in my day to day, <laughs> not. <laughs> um, um, I I think it was at Slush in uh, Iceland um, in where they, they made a special slush VR. And, and I still remember I came back and said like, guys, VR is not gonna happen, at least not in the next two years. The content is not there. Um, the content production is so expensive at the moment that most studios, most companies in, this, in the field either dry out or they find a different source of revenue. 
um, the adoption is not is not happening. I think that the devices are pushed out too much and and not as a community not there yet. But I think we had the first game that hit more than a million um, sale in, in terms of more than a million copies sold um, two weeks ago. Um, so I think it's slowly starting to pick up. But I'm a, my bet is on AR um, in 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 comparison to VR. I think that's going to be way more. It's more social, and I think this is the big aspect, right? VR is very lonely in that sense, that it's very you and yourself focused, and AR is very, very social because it can happen in our everyday life. So um, give, so give us a, 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 like a very simple, short explanation of the difference between VR and AR. So, so VR basically takes you from where, wherever you are and puts you in your encapsulated space um, and has nothing to do with your environment, and then that's at least how I define it. So it's, it's really a space which is away from where you are here and where you are in that physical space and puts you in a different world. So it teleports you in a different universe. And augmented reality is about enhancing the environment that you're already in um, as, as a core concept. And of course, the boundaries between AR and, and VR can, can at some point really merge. So if, if AR becomes very, very, very immersive, um, you can turn this place into, into a Star Wars um, theme and suddenly you might feel that you're in a completely different universe because the AR is, is so immersive mm -hmm. at that point that, that will still take a while to get to that point but um, that's for me the big difference so VR is really encapsulated teleporting to a different universe and AR is enhancing your existing world with okay. um, with content and, and what do you see as being the, the main application for that in, in the near future for AR, for for VR, I guess both. But I guess you're 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 shifting more into the AR side of things. Yeah, I mean, for, um, for us, we don't care. I mean, if if VR finds a massive application case around us, we're we're very happy. Um, so we don't we don't care who is using in the end our our data for what purposes. Um, if if it's for VR, we're we're very happy. So we integrate with Unity, and then from there, um, take it wherever you want to take it. But uh, I think VR has a very very big. Um, reason for being in education and in simulation and everything where actually the ability to, to, to teleport someone into a different environment is really the killer, killer feature. And I think this is where um, um, it, it will play or will make a big difference. Um, and I think education is going to be and, and training is going to be the big one for that. And for AR, I think it's just going to be our new computing platform in the sense of it's going to be our new device. I think it's, it's, um, it's all about your daily use of technology will be will be handled with AR, right. so it will be ubiquitous. Okay. I think I hope we will not have <laughs> smartphones in our hands anymore in like five years. Do you see that happening I mean, with so much <coughs> being invested with some some of the the big companies and and not putting out a, a usable product? I, I think it just needs time. I think it's it's something which is technologically extremely hard to achieve. And I think this is what has been underestimated by the industry and by the hopes and dreams that has been created by that industry, it's simply bloody, bloody hard to achieve and to make it immersive that you really feel completely um, in, in that space. It's technologically just so tough, but it's a matter of time. Okay. And I think people didn't, didn't, didn't imagine right. like 200 years ago that you could fly <laughs> around and stuff. And um, so it's just a matter of time in my opinion. Yeah. So back a little bit about, about you, do you consider yourself more of a Entrepreneur, a photographer, and an inventor, or what? entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now that you you built your gigapixel camera, you're using that for your own photography? No, <laughs> no, no. Um, you and I have had a lot of conversations around the startup scene, and yes. yeah, it's it's. Um, how do you how do you see that? I mean, it's it's evolved. It's been about I think nine years that I've been involved in and seen such huge growth in the Swiss startup scene, yet Switzerland still is, uh, still has a ways to go. Yeah, still tiny. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your, your thoughts on, on entrepreneurship in Switzerland. And uh, so I, I had, so s I understood something, and, and my parents are German, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm an, an immigrant, so to speak. Um, and I had a conversation with one of the, the, the um, very famous person here, and comes from the, the guilds in Zurich and we talked a bit about entrepreneurship um, and he wanted to give, potentially give a talk at, at one of the schools and to inspire the new generation to come up and I said like yeah this is this is really cool um, and then he said something and said like you know like 
back then with my grandparents, like if you were in a guild and you would go bankrupt, you would get expelled from the guild, right? And I think this is something which is still culturally part. Yeah, yeah. And I think this this is like something which is still ingrained in that culture of, in the end, if you fail here, you're done. I mean, try to get if you have a bit tribong, try to get an apartment, right? And, and this is the the thing that that especially financial or or economic failure here is really really still a death mark. Um, in that sense, and I think this is something which has to change inherently. I think it, it already is changing a lot, um, at least in the in the entrepreneurial community, and we have more more startups coming, so this is good. Um, but I think the the as I said before, I think the success stories have to happen, um, and only then you will start um, inspiring the 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 Swiss ecosystem to really take off because everyone wants to earn money in the end, right? And and if if start, investing in startups becomes a way to become rich, um, I think then the Swiss will be, uh, will be number one. <laughs> More open to the risk. <laughs> yes. And then, uh, who knows, maybe even the banks will start investing. <laughs> if, if anyone has a question at any time, then you know, happy to take some questions. Uh, we, where's the other mic? Just one second. Sorry. And, and the last word, maybe on, on the ecosystem, I think something um, potentially amazing is happening with the with, um, Swiss Entrepreneur Fund, where, where suddenly Switzerland came together and said, well, we have to have, or Schneider Amon came and said, we need to have that 500 million fund in order to bridge that gap um, of financing. I think this is something which um, n is often underestimated. So you get money here for early start early stage projects because you have a lot of rich people and you can, that, can get that first million, that first million and a half, maybe that first two million. But the moment you need to grow and you need to have serious money on a bank account, that's where I think Switzerland basically loses all its good cases because okay. at least historically, I mean, if you look at all the, 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 the large companies or which have high valuations now, I mean, they left Switzerland at a certain point in time and it was the point in time where they needed serious money to grow, where they had the growth indicators there and they just needed fuel in order to accelerate their, their growth. And I think um, initiatives like the, the, the Swiss Entrepreneur Fund, they can at least on paper really change that. And so that's why we should all cross our fingers that everything goes well. Hi, my name is Rafał Solis. I'm from Mojabs, Virtual Reality Software. Uh, what do you think about Oculus solution and strategy from Mark Zuckerberg uh, about the virtual reality, augmented reality? and uh, HoloLens 2 <coughs> solutions? Um, I haven't tried HoloLens 2 yet, um, but I only heard positives. Um, uh, and, and I know some of the people behind, and they're very, very good um, computer scientists and scientists in, in, in general. So I think they're on a very good path. Um, and I think they, I mean, they said from the very beginning that, that industry applications are their focus, and I think that's a very good move. Um, and I think Microsoft is doing a lot of things right in that space. No comment. <laughs> I stay neutral. I'm Swiss. <laughs> um, no, I think I th no. I mean, to be honest, I think there's so many versions of this, and I think um, that's the real beauty about AR and VR that you have so many different. Uh, versions of what that world could look like. And I think the only, we only have to try out. I think we cannot know today what that new universe will look like. I think there's just absolutely no chance to imagine it. And I think we just have to play and try and see how we as a, as a, as a population, as a, as a human race actually pick that up. Um, I think it's impossible to predict. Uh, shape for sure, yes, absolutely. I encourage everyone to shape it in a positive way. Yes. I, I think carrying on in that light, there's a, <coughs> excuse me, there's a great article doing the rants just now by Wired's Kevin Kelly uh, yes. called Mirror World. Yes. <laughs> there's a wonderful call to arms at the end of, of that piece. We're not too late. There's a lot of content to be built. This feels to me kind of like the web did 20 years ago, where it was exactly. just this great open space that everybody can contribute and create content for. Yes. Uh, of course, the best thing about the web is it's uh, 
decentralized nature, do you worry that underpinning some of these AR cloud infrastructures we'll have to build for this, that they'll be dominated by a few individual companies and your content just yeah. lives on somebody else's server? Um, I, I, I fully, 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 and with a company, fully, 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 completely, absolutely support um, the whole decentralized aspect of it. And I think this is one of the cornerstones why the big ones sorry host, um, will we'll not make it um, because in the end you need to have a cross-platform and I think the web was not uh, a single company type of entity but it was basically an infrastructure which could be openly used by anyone and I, I doubt that Apple would be happy to use um, Google Core or uh, Magic Leaps or Microsoft's um, platform in order to run their AR devices and I think um, this is actually also on our side why we make that big bet and in the end it has to be a cross-platform player and it has to be accessible because in, in the end anyone, everyone needs to go to the same, to the same source, right? So uh, it's not that on, on Apple you have a different internet than you have on your Android device than you have on your, on your, um, on your laptop at home. They all have the same internet, right? And I think this is a cornerstone of that new revolution that it's cross-platform and completely independent. Yeah. And yes, it's a great article. Read it. It's called Mirror World is the next um, tech platform. Something like that. Wired, front page. Long read, but worth it. I have also a question to competition. I mean, um, for example, Google is also a good example. You have also augmented reality. Well, at least I think like Google Maps, you know, they do a similar product. They do a 3D model of the city. Yes. So how did you differentiate your product so that you know, big players don't oh. don't eat you. <laughs> don't, don't put me in that spot here. And um, they're sponsors, okay? Um, Safe space. Don't worry. <laughs> no. Um, and I, I think the from our side. So there's there's two answers to that. So on the 3D side, um, I think we we are very very bullet, bullish about fidelity and, and detail. And I think um, have that big hypothesis that the more detailed your your spatial data is, and and that's also applying to the 3D model, of course, the more versatile is your application space. And, and if you look at, at that part, the really hard part is to crack that code. How can you, in an automated fashion, create super high fidelity 3D models, which are then applicable not just as a, as a UX, they are applicable for autonomous vehicles, they're applicable for gaming, they're applicable for AR, and all that diversity is encapsulated in that, in that original model. Um, and I think this is what we spent our time on and the second part is that um, is the whole infrastructure around it that anyone in the end can add data to it. Um, I think that's the second part. So very happy if, if Google wants to stream their data. <laughs> Please do so. <laughs> Actually, a very simple question. Um, I, I'd like to know how you monetize or how the business model looks like in, in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, so business model, um, from our side, the, the very core of it is paper usage. So the more something is being used, the more you have to pay for it. And then there is um, different ways on, on how to make it possible for people to pay for that through advertising or whatever it might be. But the core is the more you use it, the more you pay. And the data rights are never transformed, uh, are never transferred. So whenever um, you want to use a 3D model or other different types of data for your application, you you pay for the usage or for the rent of that data. So like this, the data always stays with the originator. Yeah. And, and because we're Impact Hub, I'd love to know uh, how you would frame or how do you see what you do and your company does um, in terms of an impact for society at large. Um, I, I mean, I think we're, in that sense, I mean, as I said, I think the, the applications which come out of that revolution of making the real world machine readable, like autonomous vehicles, augmented reality, and so on, they will completely transform the, the way we live our lives. Um, and I think they would really have that, that impact that, I don't want to say every, but a lot of elements in your daily life might potentially, under circumstances, change. Um, and so that's, I think we're just, blessed to be part of, of building that future. Thanks. Going back, talking a little bit about uh, your journey as an entrepreneur, what has been one of the most challenging aspects of, of building Nomoku? 
Um, <laughs> there are so many. <laughs> um, I, I think the most challenging on a, on a meta level, without going into details, is you yourself and your company, you have to reinvent yourself multiple times throughout that journey. So a company where you're five people is going to be a different company when you're 10 people, and it's going to be a different company when you're 30 people, and it's going to be for sure a different company when you're 500 people. Um, so pure culturally, you have to reinvent yourself. You as a founder have to be different if you are a founder with three co-founders and five people in total as a team. You need to act and behave different than if you are a founder with 30 people and you're a founder with 10,000 people. So you yourself have to reinvent yourself. Your business has to reinvent your, itself because you'll probably go out with something which is not the perfect product market fit in the first place and you have to pivot a little bit and adjust and this. So there's many moments where you have to completely reinvent you yourself, the company, the culture, the product, and most of the time that happens at the same time, right? So, and you have to somehow keep up with that struggle and some people will, will like it, some people will not like it. Um, you have to explain it to the investors, you have to explain it to the clients, you have to explain it to your family. And um, so all of that happens and needs to happen, right, in order to be successful. And I think this is the hardest part to also then let go of that past, right? To say, yes, this is our new self and, and we embrace it and, and we let the, the, the old self go. I think this is the hardest part and that happens just on a regular basis. Okay. And how, how big is your team now? Uh, we're 35 now. In three locations? No, we're mainly here in Zurich. Um, we have an office in, in, uh, in Luxembourg and we try to go to California and, and Asia as much as we can. Okay. Yes. And, and so I guess as an as entrepreneur, as a founder, as a having a company, like you just said, you start off with a few friends and then you, say, then you have to hire the first person that you don't know who they are where they come from and then you have to start hiring more people and then you have to get, are you still doing the hiring or how, how has that been? How has that been the, the, the concept of, of um, building your yeah. team? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, in, in very, very beginning, very, very involved in the hiring. I think it's, it's super important to build that core and be very present at building that core. I think that's, um, that's your job or that's one of your many jobs you have as a founder. Um, but at some point you need to let go of, of, of one of those things, right? You cannot be the bottleneck. And I think this is something which, especially as an entrepreneur, is hard to say, well, I, I take myself out of that equation because I need to let other people step up their game and, and, and actually trust that they will do that job right. Um, and if they don't, then they're wrong people, right? I mean, that's, that's a hard, hard statement, but I think as an entrepreneur, you need to, you need to establish that, that trust that you let go. Um, so today, I think it's, it's very opportunistic. So sometimes something pops up and, and a person writes me on LinkedIn or this or that, and then um, we pick it up from there. So it happens from time to time, but, but largely um, you need to let the people who are hiring for that team run, run the show. I mean, in the end, it doesn't matter that I find the person amazing. If the people working with that person think it's a complete uh, nutcase, then uh, that's not gonna work out anyway. So um, think decentralized in that way as well. Let the people who actually are working with the person together um, do that job. Um, and sometimes they don't want to do that job, so that's then, the, then it becomes more difficult. <laughs> and what's, what are some key elements that you look for in, in a hire? Because obviously you have the, the technical skills or the, the hard skills that you need, um, but there's so much more in being a team. Um, sorry. Um, that also changed. I have to say, I think now we're looking much more for um, expertise and, and long la more long-lasting experience. I think we started to value how much value it can bring that if someone really understands the topic for a very long time. Um, and there are certain elements in a company which simply are repetitive. I mean, there's have been hundreds of companies, no, thousands of companies been built before and, and some aspects it just matters that someone has a lot of experience. Um, so that's something which has, has added, I think we um, look more for that, so more for specific skills. Of course, the interdisciplinary kind of jack of all trades starts to lose a little bit of relevance when you're more people because you need to have more expertise and, and the, the field of kind of actions get a bit more narrow. 
um, you still want to have uh, the cultural fit, I think, is, is still very, very important. So um, having people with a lot of emotional intelligence is going to be even more important the more people you are, so that's something you really should look out for. And I think it's widely underestimated how important that is, um, especially in, in today's fast transforming world, I think. Um, uh, and it's hard to, to, to assess on top. Yeah. No more cool. Yes. No more cool. <laughs> I wish there would be a fancy story. <laughs> did, you, did you misspell it? No, no, no. No, it, it actually com comes from... Um, so just to clarify, Nomoko is the name of the company. <laughs> we're not, we're not <laughs> talking gibberish. No, no, but it, it, there, there is an African tribe which is called Nomoko. So, this is, so okay. I wish there would be like a very cool story to it, but it, it's essentially, um, so cameras, they have this mount uh, where you mount your lens. And we, we, or I found it very, very funny to, um, if you have a very high resolution camera, you don't need to exchange lenses anymore. This was the whole kind of concept back then because you can just zoom in digitally and that's it, so you don't need to like it. So you don't need a mount, right? And then I thought, well, why not call it no more for no mount because the whole industry was making a fuss about their perfect mount. It was all about that you cannot use a Nikon lens with a Canon body and the other way around. Um, and then I looked up the, the web address and it was nomo.co, which was um, suggested, which was the, the big .co kind of moment um, uh, for websites. And then I asked my girlfriend, what do you think sounds better, Nomo or Nomoko? And then she was like, yeah, Nomoko sounds better. So that's, okay. and then Twitter handle was free and Facebook and everything was free. That works. <laughs> exactly. <Cool. laughs> so. No, but that's, that's the, a lot of people get stuck on a name. And, Doesn't and, matter. And, and you know, it's what I, I tell people, it's like, yeah. what is, again, no offense, what does Google mean? <laughs> what does Yahoo mean? What does Bing <laughs> mean? It's, it, there's, you know, but then you build a brand around that and then people will remember the name. Yes. Um, Absolutely. I mean, don't, don't don't pick a stupid name, <laughs> like one which is already taken all over the world. I think this is I actually I think actually today this is a very hard part. It is to find a name which is not already taken and doesn't have the trademark and this and that and domains and whatnot. And so that's for sure. Yeah. What do you love hate about being an entrepreneur? Love hate or love and hate? What do you love? What do you hate? What do you? Um, I love the, the, the capability to, to shape. I think this is really the, the, the I love the capability to build. Um, what do I hate? Oh, this is a tough one. I, I get completely frustrated, and I think that gets, gets close to hate if you have things, there, there's things as an entrepreneur you have to do which don't bring your business one single step forward and consume a shit ton of energy and time and everything and they just have to get done because if you don't do them, then you fuck up. Um, but they don't add any single value to you as a company. Um, so those things are a big pain in the butt um, and they normally, no one wants to do them so they end up with you as an entrepreneur. Like? I, <laughs> I will not tell. <laughs> board no, meeting, board is, meetings? No, board meetings are fun. Our board meetings are, are, I mean, we have, at least our board meetings are great. We have a very, very nice board, um, enjoy it a lot. Get good board members, that um, is another advice. Some which understand startups and some which come from a non-startup world as well. I think that was uh, for us a very balance. good lesson. Hmm? Uh, to have that balance. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that was like uh, one of, of our board members is a former CEO from a, of a private bank and, and, and that brings such a different perspective, right? And and, and he thinks in complete different terms and perspectives and everything, and that's just so refreshing because you're, you tend to be in that startup bubble, right, where, where, where it's, it's very energetic and very self-fulfilling and everything, and, and have someone come in with a complete down-to-earth, both feet standing here uh, mentality is, is, uh, is very nice. So that's something, I get that diversity in terms of mindsets. Good point, yeah. And um, what would you tell a young Nielsen, a young you, uh, <laughs> don't be so full of yourself. Um, so I think the, 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 you start, ah, oh, this, I don't want to sound bitter now. You start very, very idealistic. And I think throughout that time, you start to realize why maybe people you, you, you meet and mentor you or this or that, 
um, give you certain advice, and then you look back, it's like, ah, okay, this is what they meant. Um, but I think this is just something which only experience can, can, can tell in the end. I think this is something you just have to go through. Um, I completely understand now why investors say that they like to have a more experienced founder or someone who went through that journey already. And I was very not getting that when they told that in the very beginning. So it was like, it's like, ah, I get you now. It's like, I would probably do the same if I would be an investor. Um, yeah, and these are the things I think you just, you don't like, I think in the beginning, you think you can plan ahead or you can imagine what's going to happen and you really are cognitively very focused on like the future and the next steps and you think you can strategize the shit out of it but reality is just different and and a lot of the, the important things are actually things you cannot foresee in the first place so have that humbleness that the future will bring you something you didn't didn't imagine in the first place and speaking of investors, would you advise people to not take investment early? Oh, well, if you can afford it. <laughs> I, I think it completely depends on your business. I, I think if you can bootstrap it and if you have money on your own bank account or whatever the reason might is, I mean, the, the, the longer you can wait to take money in, in the sense of the higher devaluation of your company, um, I, I think the smarter that is. But on the other hand, having capital early on also makes you move faster, right? So I think you always have to find that balance between when is the right moment where you can pour money at your business and make it faster. And I think this is something as, a, as an early founder, I, 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 I would not have recognized this, but having a lot of money early on is, is not making you faster as a company. And I think this is something I probably would have completely disagreed two years ago with, um, I think there's certain th steps which simply take time and you cannot really accelerate them with money. Right. Um, especially when you do it for the first time. Um, but then there's the moment where a company simply needs, the more gas you put in, the faster you go. And mm -hmm. that's the moment where you should raise as much money as you can. Right. And of course, when you raise money, at some point in time, they're going to want it back, right? <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> Do you have an exit strategy? Uh, IPO. Okay. Yeah. And um, was there a time in in uh, with Nomoko or just in general in business from that you had a major fuck up and failure or something, and how did you come back from that? No, we never. We did everything perfect. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is the worst Swiss company. Come on. I mean, uh, no. Of course, you have it all the time, and I think it's. It's a matter of, as I said in the beginning, right? As a, as a figure skater, I used to, to fall down and had to literally get up. And I think it's the same with, with a company. And you have fuck ups in many forms. You have, um, you have fuck ups with clients. You have fuck ups with investors. You have fuck ups with people. You have all of that. And it's just normal. It's just what it is. It's part of the learning process. You just have to somehow get up with it, get, get up again, and, and learn from those mistakes if possible. But sometimes you have to do a mistake twice until you learn, that's also part of the game. Yeah. Very true. Yes. Hopefully not more than twice, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not more than once, you know, like in the first place, but, but I think it's okay. I mean, it's... it's um, as long as you keep getting up and you learn every, yeah. every time. Yeah, yeah, and I think we, we, we recently had a conversation where you have that, that, that saying of learn, like fail fast. And I think that's widely misunderstood in the sense of um, failure is great. Failure fucking sucks. I mean, doing a mistake hurts, and it's good that it hurts because you shouldn't do it again, right? And and it's absolutely fine that it hurts like fuck, and you're embarrassed, and you 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 are just like ah for like two weeks. This is okay, um, but it's important to learn from those mistakes and not let that feeling stop you from doing mistakes. And then there's a big difference between all oh, failures are great because you can learn from them, which is this kind of fail fast and failures are, are amazing uh, type of culture to say, you know what, we encourage the experiment. And I think this is a very, very big difference. It's like, if you want to move a mountain, you're going to fall. It's like a kid. If it starts to walk, it's going to fall. That's just what it is. It has to get up again, um, but that should not keep you from walking. Um, and I think this is a very, at least for me, this is a very big difference between saying it's cool to fall and saying, uh, 
and be courageous to walk. Right, yeah. And in taking care of your, your team, your company, what, what, are some, what are some of your top tips for that, that a founder can do for his, his company, for his employees? Uh, try, I mean, we, we, we have a lot of conversations about this, uh, about being nice or being kind. Um, I think you, be, being nice is, 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 being kind is important, right? Being nice is not kind sometimes. And be kind, but be, be honest. Um, don't focus only on the, so there's a tendency that you put your focus on the things which don't work. And, and that you take care of the people which are in trouble, right? There's a big tendency as human beings for that. And there's a big tendency to forget about those which actually perform really well because they're not trouble, right? So, and, and it's like with them, it's super easy and, and you're casual and you're nice and everything is going and you don't need to like steer it in any direction. And, and it's very, very easy to forget about that. And I think this is um, just a human symptom that, that we tend to, to take our time and take care of those which are trouble um, because this is the thing which screams at us and is like, is, is, is right there, needs to be fixed. Um, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Everyone, but everyone needs oil. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is this is really really important. And it's so easy to forget. Mm. Um, oil the ones which are running smoothly because if you oil them, they will never get squeaky in the first place. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. <laughs> so um, we're coming closer to the end. If we have any a few last questions from the audience, um, if not, yes. Uh, just a question about the um, so spatial data platform. Mm -hmm. Do you think you already have an idea of what are going to be the categories of hero types of applications for for spatial data? And have you ever thought about the company building out those applications yourselves? Um, how to answer that? No. Um, without giving too much away, um, no. Um, I mean, I think there is, there, there, of course, there, there is, there is applications in the pipeline which, which will drive a lot of traffic. And I think um, by now it's not a, not a secret anymore that autonomous vehicle simulation, and and in, in general simulation for robotics um, and autonomous systems is going to be a big, big hit and a big runner. Um, Toyota speaks about it as a 100 billion mile problem. And, and if you have a fleet of 10,000 cars, I think it takes you 15 years to drive a billion miles, which is what the regulators believe is the, is the number you need to drive in order to demonstrate that your self-driving car is safer than a human being because you need, to, we humans make, a, make an accident every 100 million miles, a fatal accident. So we're actually quite good drivers, and um, at least when it comes to that. And um, so I think that's gonna be a very natural one because it just profits so immensely from that capability of having the real world in the first place and training the algorithms, certifying the algorithms, testing the software, having hardware in the loop simulation and so on done. So that's a, a very natural one. I think architects are very, very natural um, takers. Um, maybe less at scale than autonomous vehicles but um, they already think in 3D, they already think in, 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 in visual applications, they have more and more construction sites which are not a single building anymore, but an area development where you have a completely new district in a town which gets completely rebuilt, um, and that then ties into the whole urban planning part. Um, games, I think, will be massive. I think entertainment is picking up, um, and, and gaming is picking up on a regular pace. Um, Overall, as an industry, you have esports and everything. I think that's that's a industry which will only grow. Um, then you have, I think, everything IoT is 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 going to be a big supporter of that because they feed a lot of data into those systems. I think analytics will be massive. I think there's more and more more companies. Um, building machine learning and analytics based on satellite imagery and, and that will simply expand to a more fine-grained um, understanding of, of cities um, where it's really about predictive analytics where to say what is the oil price going to look like, what is the, the stock price of, of, of Walmart because you can analyze how many cars are in front of the Walmart park and all of these kind of things, they will, they will start to happen more and more. Um, and, and 
as a company, I think we have, yes, we will build own spatial applications, um, but also mainly to understand how are those built, because I think you need to be your own customer, and then let's see what comes out of that. I have one more, one more question. Um, when you first started, um, <clears throat> or when you were smaller, what was the biggest challenge in getting um, someone to join who is kind of an expert in their field that you had no expertise in, maybe like data science or, or computer science or whatever it was? What was the biggest kind of challenge to, to convince people or get people on board that have the expertise that you really need? I, th I, uh, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I think we, we so far almost always managed to get those on. I, like, it, it, it was very easy for us. So either the people were like, this is completely ludicrous what you guys are doing. This makes no sense and, and whatever and fuck off, um, which I think sometimes you get, especially when you come as an outsider to an industry, as a new player, have maybe a completely different approach to how things are done. Um, so this is this can be a natural reaction. So it has either been that or it's like, oh, awesome, cool. How can I kind of join into this? And I think um, what maybe helped us um, to give you a more productive answer is I think we've been very humble in terms of knowing what we are good at and, and knowing from very early start we need to have people um, which have skills we simply ha don't have and have knowledge we simply don't have. Um, and, and hired them then specifically for that. I think that potentially helped to get those people on board. And giving, I think we gave a lot of freedom um, in order to explore um, and give a lot of um, autocracy to those people, not autocracies, uh, a lot uh, autonomy to those people because in the end they are the experts, right? They are the people who know more about it so you should give them the autonomy to, to um, shape that as well. Yeah, um, I think it's a topic that uh, we could spend all night here talking on, but uh, I don't think we have all night. <laughs> but uh, we do like to wrap up with, um, as, as you know, our famous rapid fire questions. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come prepared? No. <laughs> Good. That's, that's what we like. It's uh, the first, first thing that comes to mind. Just, yeah, so, so some quick questions and um, okay. there's no right or wrong answer. Uh oh. <laughs> What is something that you own that you would never sell? <laughs> do, do, I don't know. That's fine, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what is your most unusual skill? Dude, you're hard. Uh, <laughs> my most unusual skill? I think in this room, I think figure skating is pretty unusual, but. Uh, well, I, I cannot do it anymore. <laughs> I have this, I have this, this <laughs> like, this, uh, yeah. But, but no. Okay. <laughs> What's more important, strength, speed, or stamina? Stamina. Which historical figure do you admire? Mm. Current, past. Oh, what is what is historical? <laughs> um, Einstein. I think he he really transformed. Yes. What is your favorite season of the year? Winter. Team or single founder? Team. When was the last time that you tried something new? This morning. <laughs> no. Um, something completely new. Okay. On, on the weekend. Yes. Cats or dogs? Oh, cats. That's an easy Beer one. or wine? Wine. Your favorite app? Email. <laughs> What's something on your bucket list? Um, probably do a, 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 a travel around the world with my family. And if you could have the attribute of any animal, what would you choose? Ooh. If you could be an animal. Chameleon. That's pretty cool. Camouflage, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nielsen, for joining us tonight and for all that you shared with us. Uh, Likewise. Really Thanks appreciate a lot. Um, you taking your time and uh, being so candid with us. It's a real pleasure to have you.
we need people like him in Switzerland because this, this is the reason that the ecosystem can grow. This is, uh, I think I've, I've not met a single person who has dedicated so much unconditional love and energy and everything um, into us as a country um, and as an ecosystem. So a very, very big thank you. Thanks,